are listening to In The Books, a podcast where we discuss book-to-screen adaptations of our favourite stories and generally have a bit of a gossip. <laughs> I'm Michelle. Uh, you can find me at Musings on the socials. And I'm Rita. I'm at Annoying Rita on just Instagram. The Gram. The Gram. Haven't posted a picture since January. Woo! Oh my goodness. <laughs> I feel ya. Um, and welcome to our discussion of episode nine of Normal People. This series is mostly spoiler free, but we will be discussing the Sally Rooney novel. So book spoilers, ahoy. Uh, I also think it's important to note we will be discussing things like depression, eating disorders, and domestic abuse. And if that's not something that you can deal with today, uh, please take care and skip this episode. Uh, as always, we will start with a recap of the episode. Yes, and guys, this was very hard for me to recap. Oh. Bear in mind that there was so much overlapping nonsense. Yeah. So, fingers crossed this makes sense. <laughs> we began the episode, Marianne has been accepted to an Erasmus student exchange program to Lund University in Sweden. If I'm not saying that correctly... <laughs> I apologize. Y'all know the drill. That's all I can do. <laughs> yeah. She leans against a wall, looking wistful and mysterious during a party. And this is catnip. <laughs> of course, for lovesick men. Yes. And he's, she's approached by another one <laughs> who is like, who is this mysterious lady in front of me? <laughs> After the titles, we watch as Marianne goes out into the Swedish winter dressed like an extra from an album <laughs> music video. She greets Lucas as a voiceover reads an email from Connell asking if she's checked if this new boyfriend of hers, or potential new boyfriend, is a sociopath. She doesn't really have a good track record for that. We then cut to her showering. Post-sex, we must presume, because Lucas walks in and tells her she looks nice. Um, Marianne doesn't even bother to respond to this. She just keeps like, okay, yeah, I'm grooming. Leave me alone. So Lucas offers to buy her breakfast. We then cut to a cafe, where a bored-looking Marianne toys with her food and tries to break up with Lucas. He interrupts her and asks if there is anything on earth he can do to avoid a breakup. He really likes her. Marianne looks annoyed and tells him she doesn't want that. If anything, she wants the opposite of that. And thus, an unhealthy dynamic is born. Oh, joy. Huzzah. Oh, joy. Over in Ireland, Connell meets Helen's family. And her dad seems to be super like him. A rare Connell win. On the way home, they discuss their exes and Connell reveals that Lorraine liked Marianne. She probably felt a bit sorry for her. And Helen has certain ideas about Marianne. She finds this baffling. Montage time. Sad piano music plays as Helen and Connell have sex. We then cut to Marianne and Lucas, who, by contrast, are having much more dispassionate and disengaged sex Despite the bondage, after they are finished, Lucas refuses to let her shower and makes her lie on the ground naked until he says the game is done. He tells her she is worthless and walks away. <laughs> this is the opposite. I'm sorry. He, he has yeah. met the criteria. Yeah. Uh, Marianne emails Connell about how she feels outside of her own body in Sweden. He reads it and then lies awake looking worried next to Helen. We then cut to Connell having a night out with Helen, Mal, and his girlfriend, Ellen. When the fact that Ellen and Helen rhyme has always bothered me. Oh, yeah, that's problematic. Uh, when he goes up to get around uh, to drink, he bumps into Peggy. Oh, yay! Um, she's at the bar. Uh, she asks how Marianne is doing, so that friendship is obviously over. Uh, she said she has heard rumors about her being into bondage, is desperate for some tea, asks if Connell was the one who got her into that stuff. Connell is immediately uncomfortable and tells her to fuck off. <laughs> <sighs> he leaves uh, and Helen finds him outside having an anxiety-induced cigarette in the car park. When he tells Helen Peggy was talking shit, Helen's response is to say that Marianne invited the rumor mill on herself and is basically deserving of all the shit she's getting. Oh, wow. Way to 
Blame the victim, wow. Helen. Connor looks annoyed and continues to smoke in silence. Helen asks him why he's so bothered, and when he doesn't respond, she walks back in annoyed, leaving Connell to mope in classic Connell style with a cigarette and a distant stare off into the distance <laughs> while moody music plays. You know, normal people style. <laughs> back in Sweden, Marianne gets an email from Connell who tells her he's sorry to hear she isn't coming back for Christmas. Marianne takes a huge bite out of pastry and savours the taste. This is the first time she's eaten all episode and I was very happy for her. She then has to call her mother to break the news. Her mother is audibly shocked and asks when they will see her ag again. Marianne says she's busy and she doesn't know. At no point do they address the real reason she isn't coming back. Yeah. <sighs> Hey. Over in Ireland, Connell drives home for Christmas as a voiceover of Marianne's email is read. She explains that with some perspective, she doesn't really think Peggy and Jamie were ever really her friends, and that when she thinks of Christmas, she thinks of Carrick Lee and the Christmas tree in his front room. She tells him he, she misses him. Connell unpacks his bags and looks forlorn. Post coitus, Lucas tells Marianne he wants to take a photo of her tomorrow, and Marianne agrees. He then orders her to get in the shower, and he gently washes her hair for her. Watch out, buddy. You're being too nice. Back in her dorm room, Marianne FaceTimes Joanna, and she asks about Lucas. Marianne immediately cuts her off, saying it's not the kind of thing where her feelings are involved. We then see Marianne pouring most of an undrunk water bottle down the drain. The next day, Marianne arrives at Lucas's studio for the shoot. She sits cross-legged in front of a bunch of very intrusive lights. As he asks her to remove her jumper, we see little flash cuts of Marianne dressing herself in a hurry. Lucas's camera light flashes again and brings us back to the spot where she sits, looking sad and lost. We then cut to Marianne grabbing her coat to leave. Then the flash again the ca of the camera as she's taking off her bra and looking very vacant and depressed. She asks Lucas if they cannot do this now. And he reminds her that this is what she wanted and begins to bind her wrists. A voiceover from Connell's email plays as the photo shoot continues. Connell tells her that he didn't mean to brush aside the things she told him in Italy and that none of the abuse she faces from her family is her fault. Quote, just because people treat you badly at times, and I include myself in that, by the way, it doesn't mean you deserve to be treated badly. A lot of people love you and care about you. I hope you know that. End quote. Lucas approaches her with another tie and Marianne tells him no. She doesn't want to do this. We then cut to her leaving the apartment and walking out into the fresh Swedish snow into the sunset. The end. I was kind of thinking, girl, you're going to be, you're going to be in the dark soon, in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. This is a bad idea. Yeah, but it was a beautiful last shot uh, with the winter sunset scene, which they probably don't get a whole lot of sun up that time of year but anyway oh man so what did you think uh perversely i know this is like one of the most depressing episodes but it's actually one of my favorites mm -hmm. um it's just like this beautiful standalone episode that gives you a real insight into everything going on with marianne mm -hmm. And the visual representations of her depression, mm -hmm. the scenery, and the acting by Daisy. Yeah. Sensational. Yeah. And it's even more incredible because it's only 22 minutes long. Yeah. I swear, it's, it, uh, it feels like it's the shortest chapter or shortest episode of the entire season. Um, and again, uh, I marvel at how much they're able to do with that time. Um, I thought um, it was uh, brilliant, and it was such a gear shift from the last episode that I think if I had been binging this, um, that would have been that would have been rough. Um, yeah, I never suggest binging normal people. It's just it's too much to take on, especially when it gets. And it gets sad. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. want, you need to decompress. Mm -hmm. you, you really you do need that time. It's, it's, it's quite a, a long amount of time between 
um, Italy and Sweden like six months it's the longest time jump that we get in the in the novel and you really need that time mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so yeah definitely um, but I thought I thought it was um, so incredibly well done um, I thought that the the reading of uh, the emails uh, was so wonderful um the the one that you shared in the recap where you know connell says just because people treat you badly at times and i include myself in that by the way it doesn't mean you deserve to be treated badly a lot of people love you and care about you i hope you know that um i just thought that was so gorgeous and what she needed to have in her mind in order for her to be able to tell Lucas, no, I'm done. <laughs> um, you know, because she she needed to know that that even if she doesn't love herself, there are people who love her, and that includes Connell. She really needed that. Yeah. I think the the use of the emails was maybe one of my favorite aspects of the episode because we rarely get insights into their mind it's a lot of again a lot of pensive smoking yes. <laughs> looking distant yes so like being able to just have them express exactly what they're feeling and what they're dealing with is really great it's a small window into what you get as a book reader mm -hmm. um and it really worked they were so clever um so marianne's relationship with food like it's really much more explicit in the novel, mm -hmm. but I really like the way they handled it in the show. Mm -hmm. um, there are little moments that echo her what's described in the novel, like the scene where Marianne goes to breakfast with Lucas and she she can't finish her waffles. She's just poking it yeah, out. Yeah, just pushing her food around. Yeah. Or when she, she pours out most of the water bottle. Mm -hmm. Um, because she's completely failed to drink even that tiny amount of water that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these are more hints that explicitly stated. I imagine that if you're just watching this for the first time, this might completely go over your head. Um, there's a moment where she receives an email from Connell, and as he's doing his voiceover, she bites into... The, the pastry. The pastry. Which, by the way... Thanks to following a bunch of Swedish influencers on Instagram. <laughs> I know that's a similar and those buns are associated with Lent. And it, I was like, what the fuck is she doing eating that at Christmas? <laughs> this is a real mistake. <laughs> but if you ignore the timeline, I think this, that was a really beautiful moment in and of itself because it really highlights like how nourishing her relationship with Connell is and when she's in like a good place and she's connected to other people she is able to fe feed herself and mm -hmm. look after herself mm -hmm. yeah I mean yeah yeah you, you know it it um you you said everything uh that I could have even come up with and and more um you know it the whole metaphoric bite into that pastry and it was a bite with relish and savoring that food um it was just oh, i get chills just thinking about it this television show. And I really want to eat that, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, she looks like she is doing the shit out of that. Absolutely. Place. Absolutely. Um, you know, this show. Uh, wow. Uh, I, I think to myself, I don't think it can get any better. And then it does. Um, yeah. Next week is probably considered one of the best episodes of the show. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. You're going to lose your mind. Okay. I'll be ready. It's really good. Uh, it's really sad. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the book versus the episode. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I uh, felt that they, I felt that they did a great job with it. And the, uh, and I know we're going to talk about uh, Lucas in uh, just a moment, but I thought that they really encapsulated who that character was um, on screen 
and uh, it made me dislike him just as much as I disliked him in the book. Um, and the the scene where, you know, he is telling her that she can't shower and she's worthless and all that kind of stuff. I was just like, oh, wow. He really bit into the, you know, I am into humiliation. That's what I want from you instead of you being, you know, so kind to me. Well, he just jumped on top of that with both feet. And uh, it was really, really um, disturbing. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of awkward for me to bring up as the white host, but here we go. I think the only major change we saw between them and the show is the fact that Lucas is black on yes. the TV show. <laughs> He's explicitly the whitest guy you could ever imagine <laughs> in the book. <laughs> Um, and this spanned like a million think pieces about how the show's only depiction of a black man was of a violent one. Um, I would question the the idea that he was violent in any way, really. It was more about power and control. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like your opinion on this. As you, we all know, I am painfully white. Um, my two cents would be that I don't feel like... Um, it's fair to think of him completely as a villain because yeah. that's a huge simplification yep. of the way the show chose to frame him. Mm -hmm. But does that justify the general lack of diversity on this show? It's hard to say because this is a story about two white people from Ireland, mm -hmm. like the countryside. Like, how diverse could that story really be? Michelle, why don't you answer this very <laughs> difficult question for me? Um, well, you know, I, I noticed that, um, Lucas and Helen are people of color. Um, and that, you know, when you said that, you know, it wasn't that he was violent. Um, and I think you're right. Um, you know, his, his thing was more about, the bondage and the humiliation um more about and domination power and domination the, the, um yeah, you know and violence and hitting her and shit exactly i mean that was jamie's shtick was you know hitting her and you know hair pulling and all that other kind of stuff um you know i don't see this as a way to you know cast someone in uh um a villainous role and have them be a person of color um i don't think that that's what they the the folks that were putting this show together were doing um you know we have seen throughout the show um individuals who have uh been either in the background or um uh, really not main characters, but, you know, extras that have been uh, individuals of color. I'm not, um, I'm not sure that that's really helping their case, though. It's like, look, we've got a few extras. It's like, oh, okay. But if we think about the, like, the, the population of Ireland, yeah. and we think about the population in Sweden... Um, you know, we know that there are individuals who are of color in both locations. And so, you know, why wouldn't there be individuals um, entering into Marianne and Connell's life who are people of color? Um, you know, I personally didn't feel like this was some coded um, casting issue. Um, around, you know, equating black people with violence. That didn't cross my mind at all when I was watching the show. Um, I'm not surprised that this became a controversial I am, subject. Yeah, though. I'm not either, because it, it, it makes sense that given, given recent events are actually not too recent anymore, uh, but uh with uh I don't the... know, it's still always happening isn't oh, it there's yes. like a low level of violence yes. always happening people say you know? um <laughs> but you know it with uh the recent um call of attention towards um 
issues relating to the BIPOC community, um, you know, I it wouldn't surprise me that there would be people up in arms about it, um, you know. And when I think about how they cast Lucas, he wasn't your, quote, typical casting of a black person in the role of like a gang member or a murderer or a robber or something along those lines. Um, you know, this this was a casting of an individual with a fairly complex um, personality. Um, you know, when Lucas first meets Marianne, you know, he is not all into, you know, the whole power and domination thing. Um, he's, I think he struck me as quite tender yes. and, like, yes. romantic. And also there's the sat shower scene where he was quite caring. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like um, the show, mm -hmm. much more so than the book, made him very well-rounded. Yes, I totally agree. Um, and that, you know, if Marianne hadn't presented him with this giant hint of you know what she was interested I, in I, just, I feel like it was an ultimatum more than a hint it was you you either do this to me or i don't see you exactly exactly and i felt there was that was much more sympathetic mm -hmm. to me because i suspect that when you someone is willing to go to such extremes mm -hmm. to be with someone like there's something wrong with him <laughs> basically i'm like dude you should have just gone to therapy yes. that's the answer to everything <laughs> yeah but it felt like he was being pulled into abusing her question mark or, or fulfilling this kind of abusive role he he her. was basically being topped from the bottom if you know, if we want to look he had at no power at in that dynamic at all, did of, he? Yeah, if we want to look at uh, these kinds of power dynamics, um, you know, the uh, Marianne was the one that basically said, "This is what I want," and Lucas was like, "All righty, okay. all right, I'll do it." But then, like, I think of that conversation where he said, "What can I do mm -hmm. so that you won't break up with yes. me?" Like, that is such a desperate sentence. Mm -hmm. Like, I would never, ever allow anybody to make me say something so, so cringe. Like, that man is deeply insecure in and of himself. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I get my reaction to the criticism of him being played by a black man is to basically say this is a very complicated role mm -hmm. with that I think is not played by like your t stereotypical macho you know you mm -hmm. have this sort of these kind of s associations with the dom persona yes and he completely subverts all of those as expectations mm -hmm. his even his body type and his he has like a very gentle sort of face mm -hmm. like he just looks like a nice guy who is doing horrible shit and i think if you have a problem with a black person playing that role you're basically saying i don't want black people to have opportunities to play complicated characters that might have nuances that are uncomfortable and you're removing a part from a person who i think is actually perfect for this role because it opens so many questions mm -hmm. about who lucas is and what his background is and how he came to be in this situation mm -hmm. If you had him played by the typical white guy that's described in the book, I don't know that we'd be remotely as intrigued mm -hmm. by this character as we are. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. <sighs> it's just... Um, and, and... Let's give people opportunities as well. Yeah. Like, why the hell are we always trying to decide who people can and can't uh -huh. play? I mean, you know, and this is this is a running theme when, you know, we're talking about some of the uh, recent productions of period dramas that we have um, hosted on this show, like Bridgerton, like um, Mr. Malcolm's List, uh, you know, and uh, like uh, Anne Boleyn, uh, you know, why not have individuals of color? playing parts that were um that were typically white in previous productions you know 
this is this is a theme moment for for in the books um <laughs> Uh, when you we should just like replay the tapes. It's time to bring out the hey, let people just play parts, please. Seriously, give people opportunities. Seriously, um, yeah. um, um and um, I just want to say that the gentleman who played Lucas and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the cast list up in front of me, but I'm not sure we could pronounce his name <laughs> even if we could, <laughs> if it's Swedish. But the, the gentleman who played the role, I thought did um, an amazing job. Yeah. I, I think he did amazing. Mm -hmm. Love to see him in more. Pro okay. I'm not going to watch that many Swedish shows, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd love to see him in more things. Yes, I agree. And I did find the actor. His name is Lancelot Nicube. What a weird name, but good for him. Yes, Lancelot. that's his name. Um, he was born in Zimbabwe. Ah, uh, okay, but that doesn't explain Lancelot as a name, does it? Mm. No, but... Then again, Lance Armstrong exists, awesome. so I don't know if we should... <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the other things that um, we see Marianne dealing with is uh, the isolation from her family. Um, and it's her uh, quite voluntary isolation from her family, um, you know. And, and to be frank, I don't wonder why she's not coming home. But, you know, that's because we've we've had the opportunity to see what's happening. Um, I think it was um, just made my slap it, my slappy hand itchy when her mother was just so, oh, well, what do you mean you're not coming home? Completely clueless and unwilling to even ponder why her daughter wouldn't be coming home for the holidays. Uh, when one of the main reasons was probably skulking around uh, in the background, her mother's listening. house. Probably at listening to the listening other end of the phone, like yeah, how you yeah. used to do in the nineties when you wanted to <laughs> listen to somebody's conversation. Um, yep. The thing is, like, as much as we're like, oh, she needs to be a thousand miles away, a million miles away from her family. I thought this was just a classic example of avoidance. Like this, oh, definitely not the solution to the problem because she needs to actually confront her mother mm -hmm. before she can heal and mm -hmm. attach. You need to do the hard work before you can run away, basically. And I felt yes. like it was just adding to her isolation in Sweden. Of just like mm -hmm. her sitting alone in the with the Christmas tree in the background was just so depressing and bleak. I was just like, oh. Just go to Connell's mm -hmm. house, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of, Connell yes. and Helen and Helen. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, well, I um, am looking at the cast list again and uh, realize that the actress who plays Helen, and I'm not even going to attempt to say her name. Alfie? Um, I think it's like Al Alfie, is that how you say it? I don't know. That's how I would say uh, it. But there's, I'm Hines. not seeing an L in there anyway, but I her think I, I father. Think, yeah, it's, it's your fave. Iofi? Um, don't try and pronounce it like it's spelt, I think is the problem. It's never pronounced how it's spelt. Mm -hmm. But her father is Kieran Hines. Yes, and we previously mm -hmm. met her in Anne Boleyn as Princess Mary. Yes. And we were like, Yes. We like her. We want more of her. Mm -hmm. And here she is, <laughs> playing an Irish girl. Yes. Um, I, I thought, first of all, I thought she did a great job. Um, I, I can understand why um, she, Helen is uh, fairly insecure about the relationship that she has with Connell. Um, because uh, Marianne is never too far from Connell's mind. Um, what I don't understand is why she is blaming Marianne. Mm -hmm. It's like, blame your boyfriend. He's obsessed mm -hmm. with another girl. <laughs> blame him! <laughs> oh, that's what bothers me the most about Helen, is there's like so much latent misogyny and mm -hmm. I, I remember in the book she's like calling people sluts and generally being very annoying 
Uh, yeah. She has like this very simple worldview as well, like a black and white thinking of you're mm-hmm. either a slut or you're a good girl like me. Um, <laughs> and her interactions with Connell, I just, you can see it's rubbing him the wrong way every time she yes. says something. Um, because I think he lives in a much more nuanced world and she's very mm-hmm. like conservative. I think. Mm-hmm outside of the fact that he's clearly in love with a whole different person and they aren't very yes. compatible as people i'm just like why are you forcing this connell i get it she's hot but come on <laughs> oh you know um i think we know that you know connell there is only one woman for connell and that's marianne and um, i think i think helen knows that as well <laughs> exactly um you know and i i think that you know, he is just doing this um, to stave off, I think, the in, the encroaching depression that he is kind of circling, circling the drain around. And, you know, having Helen in his life is uh, kind of a, an attempt to grab at a lifeline. I was going to um, say like a boy So that's a... Yeah, boy, yeah. That's a great, that's a great uh, metaphor. She's bobbing um, around on the surface and he's like, please, I'm drowning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and you know, it breaks my heart that, you know, she is being drawn into this relationship. Mm, with, I don't like um, her enough to be really that sad for her. <laughs> oh, I think she's an inherently quite unlikable person with awful opinions about things <laughs> that got herself into the situation kind of i think some of the things she says especially in the novels makes me want to, i think i hate her more than peggy i think i hate oh, helen God. More because really? yes because i think she's <laughs> peggy knows she's an awful person there's some self-awareness <laughs> with peggy where if you say like hey you're sleeping with <laughs> a guy with a, a guy with a girlfriend she'd be like yeah um, I'm terrible. But Helen thinks there's like a righteousness about Helen where she is like, I'm good and I'm normal and everybody who is not like me is a deviant and every yeah. girl, everyone that's in love with Marianne is some kind of weird sociopath because she's a slut and blah, blah, blah. And I find, <laughs> I just, I, 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 like I, I could enjoy Peggy over a glass of wine. Helen... <laughs> Could not be in the same room with her because she's judgmental and bitchy. Well, Helen, Helen talks behind your back. Yeah, Peggy is just like straight up uh, rude and obnoxious. And I, I, I <laughs> like, I feel like I can handle Peggy. Helen would say <laughs> some hurtful shit behind my back, yeah. and then I would be like, yeah. "I thought we were friends." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I can't fuck with Helen, and I look forward to her downfall. Um, speaking of Peggy, j'adore that Connor mm-hmm. was finally able to tell her to fuck yes. off. Yes, which is like me too. He's been I ho- how many years has he been holding that in for? Like finally. Oh God, I don't know. It wrote, it yeah, wrote, I I I literally cheered. I was like, yes. <laughs> it reminded me of earlier in the season where. He tells what's her face to fuck off. Do you ever just fuck off? <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Love that. Um, oh, yeah. Bless him. I kind of, yeah, again, Peggy, the worst. But I love that she remains to her core a messy bitch that just wants some gossip. <laughs> like, that's her, that's her drive. That's her MO. She wants. She's not even really that close to Connell, but as soon as she sees him, she's like, this is an opportunity for me to find out what's going on. <laughs> Love that. Oh, God. But yeah, that was that was great. Um. <laughs> Favorite moment. Uh, what's weird is that Jamie is definitely 100% the person that got her, Marianne, into BDSM. And she oh, yeah. is now acting like she's the freak. Mm-hmm. Classic male like, bullshit. Uh, yeah. It's like, excuse me. It was that dude that you seem to be so um, eager to support that it's your got this whole thing started. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but, uh, oof. Oh, I hope that's the last time we see Peggy, but I don't think it is. I can't remember. I'm going to miss that messy bitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I hope she she can come back, but keep Jamie out of out. Yeah. Of it, yeah. Yeah, we Jamie bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye boy. Bye. Um Um So for Marianne and Connell, I know we've talked about the emails um a bit already, but uh I I would love to have a book of emails written by Connell. I thought Marianne's emails were just as beautiful, by the way. And it's mm-hmm. like like girl. Mary, you should be a writer too. <laughs> and the the was that one line about um how she'll be going through her day and then like the bus conductor will look at her and she'll suddenly be like oh sh- yeah i'm here i'm alive i'm a real person and mm-hmm. anybody who's ever been through a depressive episode will have had moments like that and i think My- it's mm-hmm. just beautiful and clever and so insightful and to that we must all applaud sally rooney for being such absolutely she just has such a way with words which it's lucky she's a writer um uh you know i think that it's you know if if i ever need if i ever need to have someone understand what depression feels like or is like um this would be a book that i would share with them because it is so artfully demonstrating, um, you know, just how much of a downward spiral uh, depression is and why it is so difficult to get out of, you know, just cheer up. It's like, no, you don't understand. (laughs) There is so much more involved in this. There's a a line um, in the book where she describes a kind of numb vacuum that consumes you when you're in the the midst of a depressive episode of how like it was I think it's like the depression was like the numbness mm-hmm. becomes sort of like a coping mechanism yep where you use the numbness to sustain yourself because mm-hmm. the period before when you were like massively sad was way worse mm-hmm. The numbness mm-hmm. is probably worse for you psychologically, but it can be like such a. I think it she calls a it rel- a tranquilizer. It's a relief. Yeah, she calls. Yeah, it's it's a relief when when you go through that transition from that desperate sadness to the I have become comfortably numb stage <laughs> of things. Did you just quote um, Pink Floyd? Um... I did. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I think like in the uh, book she describes a, a depression so deep it's tranquilizing, and mm-hmm. when you, when you th- think of a tranquilizer, I think most people would be quite scared of that sensation. But if you've ever mm-hmm. been massively depressed, a tranquilizer sounds pretty good. It's yeah, you know, um, and you definitely saw that in the performance. I thought Daisy did mm-hmm. such a good job of just like she was a void. Yes. Yes. For most of the episode. Yeah. Just very um, blank. You, yeah, you know, um uh, here in the states, I I don't know whether or not they they do this um over where you are. Um but, you know, they have this form that you need to fill out um which measures kind of where you are on the depression and anxiety scale. Is it numbers? Because I've had to fill that out like every six months. Yeah, same here. Um, uh, You know, if they ask you a number of questions and you answer, for for here it's not numbers, it is um, like never, some of the days, you know, almost every day. Every day, I, you know, I find that that's kind of more thing. helpful than trying to decide out of like eight if I'm a seven or uh, a six. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's like no, it's it's it makes it it makes it pretty easy to be able to to say kind of where you are, um, you know. And there are uh, questions on it like, um, you know, do you ever feel as though um, you would be better off if you were not here or if you were dead. Um, you know, obviously, if you're answering that question, you know, Every um, day. almost all the days, uh, you know, the doctor is going to have a little conversation with you um, <laughs> um, to make sure that that you are not um, 
in danger of um, suicide. Um, but I like know, that, I that think they that... Allow, allowed room for intrusive thoughts because who doesn't sometimes yes. go, "Oh, I wonder what it would feel like to jump off this cliff." Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, That's normal, and, you know, by the way, the guys. Fa- <laughs> intrusive thoughts are normal. I thought I was weird for having them, but everyone has them. Yeah, yeah. It's like no, everybody has them, and uh, you know, I you could see you could see evidence of the things that uh, the questions that were asked in the performance that we we saw uh, from Daisy. Uh, you know, it's like, are you eating too much or too little? Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, that kind of thing. She must so, have a constant headache because she is dehydrated. Oh yeah, yeah. And I don't know whether uh, she went through a period of losing weight so that she would appear uh, thinner than she usually is. I don't know what her usual um, uh, frame is like, but I mean, it's in this show she is. She's not emaciated, but she is looking good. frail. Yeah. yeah I think part of that is the quite... performance as well, because she mm-hmm. she holds herself as somebody who looks like they might break any second. Mm-hmm. Very vulnerable, especially when she's out in, in the snow and you're like, if you mm-hmm. fall over, you may break something. And mm-hmm. You need some padding mm-hmm. on the backside. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, And speaking of the emails, I... As you said earlier, Colin email in mm-hmm. that moment, he's thinking about it in the photo shoot. Do you think that mm-hmm. sparked a breakthrough for Marianne, or do you think something was already brewing inside of her? Um, I think that that I think that hearing those words or reading those words of his was really the the nudge that she needed to. Um, to know that she had to get out of that situation, um, that there was more to uh, her life than what she was experiencing. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, that his honesty um, was really a critical thing that she needed to hear. You know, the fact that he said, and I include myself in this, by the way, um, because he knows that he has hurt her and hurt her deeply um, in the past. And, you know, he is continuing to acknowledge that. Um, so, yeah, I think it I think it was what she needed, the little nudge that she needed in order for her to, to go, OK, enough's enough. I agree. And I like that there's this constant thread throughout the show even in previous episodes potentially in further episodes question mark um about (laughs) you know whenever these two have these mental episodes i feel like the the thing that keeps them still going is this Mm -hmm. connection they have to each other of having somebody who they can talk to and who understands them and who who can be there for them Mm-hmm. unconditionally yeah. even when they are absolute little shits like Connell <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yes uh, so favourite uh, performances oh you know, man there's only there one. so many but there's only <laughs> one you know like everyone did so amazing uh huh but this is yeah. Jay-Z Edgar Jones oh episode, absolutely and everyone else was just like supporting her you know mm-hmm. yeah <sighs> Um, it was, it was really a tour de force and, uh, I am, I can't wait to see where this is going to go. Nowhere happy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I know there's, there's a lot to come and, uh, I am, I'm buckling my seatbelt to be, um, kind of, uh, blown away by performances. You will be because like. Right, off the top of my head, I can remember vivid scenes from each episode. Like, I, it, like, do you know how rare that is? My memory is terrible. But if you say, like, episode 10, yeah, I can tell you a really good scene in episode 10. Episode 11, right off the top of my head, there's an amazing scene that is so good. And then, <laughs> obviously, the finale is really good, and I remember that, yeah. Like, I don't have a good memory. 
<laughs> so that just tells you, like, you're, you're not going to be disappointed. Like, they yeah. really nailed the landing. Oh, Which is so awesome. rare, as we have discovered on this podcast. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I am. I'm really looking forward to the next episode, although I think I will make sure that I um, am up on my meds. Yeah, and... <laughs> it can be triggering. Uh, I kind of yeah. like watching watching other people be depressed on screen. I find it really comforting because I think mm-hmm. so much of, of my life I felt quite isolated mm-hmm. in, you know, it feels like nobody understands you to be a dramatic teenager. <laughs> and then you realize when you're like up on your meds and you're going to therapy and you're doing all the right things, you realize, oh, this is a u- almost a universal experience because everybody has, a, it, may, it may not be chronic, chronic depression, but you everybody has like a, de- a depressive episode. Um, yeah. It's a universal experience. Like everybody, everybody hurts. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes. So it's comforting to know that, you know, other people have been through it and they made a TV show about it because they were like, yeah, you need to not feel alone. Um, I feel like everybody should be forced to watch this. <laughs> it really it really is uh, an amazing show to um, to watch if you if you really want to see what if you really want to see depression well represented on screen. You know, I don't know how many people uh, have a desire for that, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, we have seen um, some shows that have, you know, talked about depression, you know, at one point or another. And I think that that this show is doing a fantastic job at um, an honest representation of what depression can look like. It's not, you know, everything is like, woe is me and that kind of thing. It can be very sneaky and um really something that not everyone would recognize unless they've been there yeah i feel like that's another thing the show does is it doesn't drop massive handfuls of this girl is depressed ding 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 let's get a checklist out and uh mm-hmm. take them off if you know the signs to look for they are everywhere aside if you have very little experience, a lot of them might go over your head. And that's, I like that. Um, favorite scenes? Oh, man. Um... And for me, I think uh, it's definitely the photo shoot. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the scene was super intense and uncomfortable, and the performances and the acting were insane. It was superb. But I like the way they framed it. So. When you go into the scene, you get all those shots of her leaving the room. I felt like that was a really good framing device. It made me feel sort of safer Mm -hmm. in the scene because I knew, you know, she would get out of the really depressing, dark scene that we were about to have. I like that they chose to do that. That's obviously not something that ha- that would come from reading the book or anything. That was a storytelling device they chose that I think really enhanced the story. Mm-hmm. So, what about you? Um, I would I would agree that that was a a, a great scene and the performances were fantastic. Um, I think that the scene that we had with I think the scene where we had her talking to her mom on the phone. Um, that was a good one um, because, you know, it, it's we're not seeing her mother. Uh, you know, we're just hearing her on the other end of the phone. Um, but, you know, you see Daisy almost closing in on herself um, as she's having the, the conversation about, you know, the fact that she's not coming home. Um, it's it's all about Daisy this week. Um, she is insanely yeah. good. Yep. Why didn't she get an award, Michelle? Honestly, I do not know why. And it's pissing me off. <laughs> oh. It's pissing me anyway, off. Anyway, uh, costumes. Yes. Hair and makeup. I feel like her costume choices a vibe, obviously, because mm-hmm. she always looks insanely good. Uh, again, like she's in an ABBA music video. Yeah. And they've Honestly. decided this is they're, they're leaning into the Swedishness now. Yeah. Um, but I thought some some of her her choices 
in clothes felt like an almost another form of self-harm because none of them looked practical for her new environment. She should be layering the <laughs> fuck up. She's out yeah, here she wearing platform bundled. boots, mini skirts. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh, I'll wear a decorative furry jacket that offers little to no warmth. That Girl, doesn't this button isn't a... or anything along those lines. Impractical. <gasps> this isn't a fashion show mm-hmm. you can get real hypothermia and she couldn't look like she couldn't walk in some of the scenes like oh god mm-hmm. i would like to have seen the scene of her going to like a vintage shop in dublin before being like i'm going to sweden let me find a really impractical fur coat <laughs> <laughs> oh <Okay>. god <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, um, I thought that that she looked fantastic. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think she looked a bit cold though? Oh God, yes. <laughs> God, yes. I mean, I I was literally, you know, looking at the television, going, "You are about to freeze to death," <laughs> as she's wandering around out there in the snow. I turned into my mother. I was like, "You call that coat? What are you wearing?" <laughs> You can't leave exactly. the house looking like this. Exactly. That yeah. is not a coat. <laughs> that is a costume. I, I loved all of the scenes of, of her walking around the campus because everyone mm-hmm. else was dressed like really practically <laughs> yeah. and like with the expensive thermal coats. And yes, shoes. and scarves and all that stuff. And what what are what are you wearing? Please. I had a mini skirt and yeah. a very thin pair of tights. Yeah, uh, that's and basically great. she was wearing what she was wearing in Dublin, <laughs> except with the added coat. With the coat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> coat does everything. Yeah. She's... Um. So locations and photography. So the final shot of Marianne walking towards the sunset was filmed in Lulao. I think that's how it's pronounced. Don't hold your breath. Uh, she's walking through part of the Baltic Sea, which surrounds the town mm. and that freezes up into a meter thick each winter. Holy the crap. frozen sea allows residents of Lulao to travel to nearby islands, which makes the last shot of her walking so much more powerful to me. She is literally walking on water, bitch. She is Jesus. <laughs> Imagine just being like, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just walk to an island over there." Bye. Wow, that's crazy. Uh-huh. Um, this episode was actually the last thing to be filmed for the series. The rest of the filming took place in the summer of 2019, uh, but the crew had to wait for snowfall in Sweden, which obviously meant waiting a while. And it only snowed at the very end of February. Uh, into March 2020, and that's when they flew out to complete filming. Wow. You may well r- remember that that was right before coronavirus hit. Yeah! <laughs> so they all got really, really fucking lucky. Yes. <laughs> that they managed to film at all and complete, because the show premiered in April. That is a tight turnaround. That is they, crazy. They really lucked out. Yeah. And, wow. Um, I think in the book she's much further south in Sweden. Mm. She, she's near, I think, like Malmo and Copenhagen, which is right at the bottom of Sweden. This was filmed in the Arctic Circle. So, yeah. Hence, she should have been wearing more coats. She, yeah. yeah. Much, much more than that. <laughs> oh, poor girl. <sighs> As always, was there anything you did not like? I think we could just eliminate this question. <laughs> It's usually like 90% of the podcast with other shows. <laughs> just me listing all my things I don't like. Yeah. Um, but yeah. No, I, I thought it was fantastic. How many communist manifestos out of five? I'm giving it five. Same as these. So let's uh, move on over to the inbox. Okay. Hi, girls. Morgana here. How are you guys? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, you know. <laughs> as I said to Michelle earlier, conscious. Yeah. <laughs> this episode is so hard to watch so uncomfortable i think this is the first time i've rewatched. the memories i had were so profoundly sad that i always avoided it but i did it for you guys oh thank you 
And I think what makes it uncomfortable is the fact that we watch Marianne asking and giving her new boyfriend permission to treat her like an object. I think the episode portrays her difficulty in seeing herself now as an adult away from her family influence and being able to make her own decisions. Not knowing how or where to start to make better decisions for herself now she is in charge. I think this is the big problem with people who were children abused by their fathers or mothers. They learn that the same person who loves them also hurts you. That within love there is pain, violence and abuse. That within love you, your wants and needs don't count. Since you were a baby you are raised in a dynamic where you exist to satisfy your parents' wants, needs and vanities. So it's easy to accept loving someone who is ashamed of you, like Connell. Understand and accept that even. She manages to give him time to deal with all the feelings of shame he has around her, even without understanding which parts come from the social and financial differences. She still makes time for him both times they have a relationship, rarely verbalising what her preferences are, such as how she would like him to touch her in public. Because he may have difficult feelings as his wishes count in that relationship. It's easy to stay in a relationship with Peggy and Jamie because respect is not something she's used to receiving, rather being diminished so that the other person feels important, something we saw her brother do several times with her mother's permission. This episode is so powerful because we see her journey in understanding that no one will come to save her, that she will have to decide what kind of life she wants to have and what kind of treatment she's willing to receive because now she has a voice. She is no longer a dependent child. She can say no and she can demand that her wishes be taken into account. This is so difficult, deciding to live for yourself, not out of love for others or because others want the best for you, but deciding to live for yourself because you deserve something better, because you want something better. It's difficult to realise that despite Connell being a box full of anxiety, he can be in a healthy relationship, in a respectful relationship with affection, conversation and friendship. Of course he doesn't love his girlfriend, of course he's worried about his ex and trying to put together the pieces of the puzzle called Marianne, but she can't even that. Deep down she knows that in love there shouldn't be so much pain. That's why she says in the last episode, why can't I make people love me? Because deep down she knows that she receives, what she receives is not love, but she still choose, still chooses known and even controlled violence rather than the vulnerability of letting someone come in and hurt her like Connell did till the end when she will realize she can choose differently for herself in the end I just want to hug her and ask her to start seeing my psychologist <laughs> psychologist psychologist yeah I started reading psychiatrist even though that's a different profession she is really good I'm much better exclamation point now give me her number <laughs> uh, i think that's it girls have a lovely week much love morgana mm, thanks, thank you morgana. morgana oh ladies my overwhelming feeling is i want to i just want to hug marianne maybe more than connell does i do like how this episode mirrors connell's shower and lying on the bed zoning out showing they are really different sides of the same coin but I just feel awful for her. Why, oh why, does this girl continue to just die a little bit more with every failed relationship after another? I do know she just doesn't value herself and it makes me angry and hopelessly sad. She literally tells the new dude she wants him to not be kind and the ass just goes along with it. This Swedish guy, I refuse to know his name, just makes me feel anxious for every frame he's in. We can see the evidence of his relationship all over Marianne's arms. Sad face emoji. Or crying emoji. Maybe I watch too many shows where bad things happen in Scandinavian countries yeah. in the ice, snow, and cold. Yep, that was the vibe. Uh-huh. I guess I there is a... I just needed a blonde lady to come in wearing a thick <laughs> jumper and tell us that somebody had been murdered. <laughs> Very true. I guess there is a glimpse of her starting to see people for who they really are. She's beginning to analyze her past friendships, and it's obvious the only true friend is Connell. And Joanna? Why Joanna Erasure? Well, you, everybody, you know, Joanna gets missed from time to time. Um, he is actually reaching out to her, trying to tell her how much he values her and that she is worthy of love. 
even if her past history doesn't really highlight that. God, let this end. My heart really can't take much, too much more. I just want some happiness, real happiness and contentment for both of them. Both. Can we please have some sunshine and figs? <laughs> Ciao, Maria. <laughs> oh, you're not going to like next week. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Speaking of episode 10 summary, after a tragic event, Connell struggles with severe depression. <laughs> Yay! Uh-huh. Marianne remains a lifeline for him from abroad. There we go. Honestly, one of my favourite episodes. But anyway, if you're reading along with this, um, this episode covers pages 200 or 222 or chapter 16 of the audiobook. It's very manageable. That's 22 pages. We can yes. do this together. Uh-huh. Yes, indeed. Okay, well, that's all for this episode. We'll be back next week discussing much, much more. If you want to get involved in the podcast, you can email us at inthebooksnetwork at gmail.com. We are on Insta, so please follow uh, if you want fun bonus content and updates on the podcast. If you enjoyed the pod, please rate, review, and tell your friends. Thank you so much, and see you next week. Bye! Bye!